All right, everyone. Well, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, let me pray to get started. I'll hand out some things. We'll talk a little bit and then we'll jump in. God, I'm so thankful for our time together and just praying God for blessing over uh, our time in the word and that you would please add it to our understanding uh, to grapple this issue uh, that has been uh, severely twisted uh, and that, Lord, we could please, uh, by your grace, unravel that and, and see things more clearly so that we understand you better. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, yes, I do have handouts for the first session and the second session up here. I do want to hand out for the third session. Again, they're all going to look the same because I'm using the same scheme, uh, the same PowerPoint presentation stuff. So, yeah, that's going to be there. Uh, if you want to listen to the audio, just go to the gbcportage.com, scroll down past the sermons part on the main page. Don't go to the sermons tab, but if you go to the sermons part on the main page, and you'll see Thinking Through Calvinism, this exact graphic right there will be up. And then, uh, and this, yeah, the one I'm passing out right now is number three. And then also a reminder, next week we will not have class. Did you want to Mom? Um... But we won't have class next week because I'll be on vacation. So, uh, just real quick, another thing that I have here, only if you're interested, I'm not going to pass it out, but if you're interested, is tonight we're going to be talking about unconditional election and the sovereignty of God because there's a lot of comments about those things being intertwined. Uh, I, have a page, I have a paper here. It's probably about, I don't know, 14 pages long or something like that regarding how people treat God as sovereign. And what the Bible actually says about God as sovereign. And it even examines uh, some of the more literal word-for-word -word translations as opposed to uh, the more recent translations that have come out that are doing more of a thought-for-thought -thought thing. And it's amazing that you see this huge escalation in the word sovereignty. And so if that's something if that's something that you're interested in, that's oh, okay. uh, if that's something that you're interested in, you can uh, by all means come up and get one, but you don't you don't have to. Um, if you want to read it, that's fine. So, we're going to be doing a lot of heavy Bible work tonight, a lot of passages tonight, and it's probably going to be less quotes and things like that. So, let's go over the five points of Calvinism real quick. The understanding is, number one, total depravity, which we actually understand is total inability is what they mean. Depravity is you can never do anything to be accepted by God. We understand that. Inability is you can't do anything to respond to God whatsoever at all because you're so bad off. Um, and that's just not a biblical thing, especially with all the pleas that we see throughout the Bible of people to come to faith in Christ. Tonight we're going to deal with unconditional election. We'll talk about what that is and what it's not. Limited atonement will be coming up in two weeks. And then irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints, just so we, so we know where we're at. Unconditional election. This is uh, um, one of the more interesting points of the Calvinistic system. I think it's important to return to the idea that this system is logical. Okay? That's important to understand. The, the T-U-L-I-P all fit together because it is a logical system. The problem is, is when we take it and we put it against Scripture, we find that it's not a biblical system. And so that's where we get into a little bit of a little bit of trouble there. So let me give you a Calvinist definition. Election is an act of God before creation in which he chooses some people to be saved, not on account of any foreseen merit in them, but only because of his sovereign good pleasure. Does everybody understand what that means? A synonym for the word election is choosing. Okay, so choose, elect, they will go hand in hand. But God does it before creation. He chooses only some people to be saved. So the, the Calvinist definition is that election is to salvation. Who will be saved and who will not be saved. Now, if you couple this with total inability, that God has to move on somebody in order for them to be able to believe, then this fits hand in hand with it because obviously they have to be elected in order for this to happen, which means... That those whom God doesn't move on and doesn't elect, what? Too bad. To help. Too, too bad. They go to hell. Their, their destiny is certain in the lake of fire. And for a Calvinist, it doesn't matter how many times they hear the gospel. Because they haven't been elected, they will never, never go to heaven. So, it, it doesn't take any of their foreseen merit into account. And it just makes God, and here's the word, sovereignly good pleasure. 
His sovereign good pleasure is the reason why he makes choices of some individuals and not others. Now, I want you to think about this for just a second. If God is not looking at anything in an individual to select them for salvation, and the reason is, is because they want to maintain the fact that salvation has no part in our merit. Okay, so even the election to salvation, there's no merit that God looks at. But if that's the case, if there's no merit that is there, then what determines what he chooses? Well, sovereign, and we're going to talk about what sovereign is if they're white, only white people get chosen. Only black people get chosen. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's kind of like, what exactly is it that's convincing God of this? Well, it's his good pleasure. Now, that's dangerous. Because what they're telling you is, is that it's God's good pleasure that not everyone go to heaven. Yet, is that what the Bible tells us? No. God is not, no. Willing, that any should God is not willing that any should perish. Now, think about that. That's pretty interesting. God hates death. He doesn't like the fact that that happened. So, again, this is a system. Now, this is my uh, uh, unforeseen friend, Wayne Grudem, in his systematic theology book. And if you want to know why I pulled this out, uh, number one, in the second edition of his book, he calls me out personally for something that I wrote. And so I've had to respond to him, and I'm, I have yet to hear a response from him about what I have, have responded to him about, if that makes sense. So uh, I, I, he stated something. I didn't like it. And I wrote him and told him why, or I wrote about it and told him why. He got it and dismissed it. I responded to him and said, I need better answers. Let's have coffee. I'm nothing. So I don't know. We're waiting. But anyway, uh, this book is the number one book that every Bible college or seminary student uses to train for the ministry. Whether you're a missionary, whether you're a worship leader, whether you're going to be a pastor or a youth pastor, it doesn't matter. This is the mainstay book in probably 90% of the seminaries all around the world, okay? So that's why this is such a big deal, because when people read this, here's what they're seeing. It's not, let's examine the text, it's here's what it is, here's the theology behind it. So, another Calvinist definition. Now, this is a little lesser-known guy, it wasn't really about that, but it comes from the Westminster Dictionary of Theological Terms, a Reformed a reformed perspective. A view, and I want you to pay attention to this from what we talked about in, in number one, and we're going to go over it again in, in session one. A view associated with Augustine and Calvinism that God elects to save some solely on the basis of God's freedom and love and not on the basis of any merit or efforts on the parts on the part of, hum, of humans. Now notice, it's solely on the basis of God's freedom and love. God's free to do it, but he's also free to love who he wants to, which tells you that God doesn't want God doesn't love everyone. Yeah, you know, what does the Bible say? For God so loved the world. the world. You talk to a Calvinist about that, and they'll say, well, that's only the elect. Or those are the elect who haven't come to faith in Christ yet. They're elect. They just haven't come to faith, and that's the problem. But it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. See, that's the problem. <laughs> but according to them, it does say that. I'm sorry, guys. I'm hot, so I'm going to open this up a little bit. But, um, or a lot. Uh, the freedom or basis, no merit, because we can't have anything that is that is reputable in you to say that you've ever credited salvation some way, so they get rid of that. Now, if you remember from our first session, it was one of the five canons of the Calvinist, Calvinistic Synod of Dort and part of Tulip, also called unconditional predestination. Now, we're not dealing with predestination tonight. We will deal with it at another time. We'll probably do it with limited atonement because limited atonement is really easy to disprove you got seven passages in the Bible that immediately dismantle it. It's not going to take long for us to do that. So we'll probably deal with predestination in two weeks. Uh, and predestination doesn't have a lot of evidence behind it either. It's a really simple study. So everybody got this idea? Good? Okay. Here's the Calvinist Ordo Salutis. Does anybody remember? Oh, trivia question. Does anybody remember what the Ordo Salutis is? Order the Order of Salvation. It's a Latin phrase that means the Order of Salvation. How does somebody get saved? Notice the very first person, the very first thing. It's God choosing. He chooses people to be saved. The second thing is the gospel call. And I'll say this, I didn't have time to put this in a slide or anything, but normally we're told that it works this way, okay? There is uh, a general call, is what they'll call it, okay? A general call. And that is the fact that everybody is to be called to believe in Christ, so you should be preaching the gospel to every single person. And the reason why, I'll tell you later, is because you don't know who's elect. You're just being used by God to call those who are elect into the salvation that they have already been guaranteed to possess because God chose them. Okay? So that's the general call. 
But the effectual call, and that would be considered the gospel call, is for the people who are elect so that they can hear and respond to the faith that God gave them as a gift that they have to exercise because they cannot not exercise the gift that God gave them. Does that make sense? Okay, if you say no, it doesn't surprise me. That's okay. It doesn't make sense to me either. But that's what they believe, okay? So, they're elected. Then they hear the gospel call. So that they can respond to the gospel call, they're born again first. That's what regeneration is. Then they are given faith as a gift so that they can be converted. Now, notice it says faith and repentance, okay? We're going to be dealing with repentance for at least the next two Sundays about what that word exactly means because it has been so misused today. Then they are justified, which means they have a right legal standing with God. They're then adopted as a member of God's family. And the use of adoption in the New Testament, that's even debatable that that happens at the beginning instead of for glorification. Sanctification means the right conduct of life. So they'll be living in a certain way, but they'll also have perseverance, which notice how it's described. Now, this is Wayne Grudem. This is not me. Okay, this is this is a Calvinist describing the Calvinist order of salvation. Perseverance is they'll remain a Christian. So I almost picture some guys with big beards going like, we're just waiting for you to mess it up in some way to see whether or not you're really saved. Then death, they'll go to be with the Lord. And if they're not persevering at the time of death, most people will say, you're just not saved. That's the problem. You were faking your Christianity and your new life in Christ this whole time. And then glorification, they receive a resurrection body. Now, here's what's interesting about that. Uh, no, I don't want to talk about that. Let's not do that. We'll get too, too deluded in it. So, real quick, that's the order of what they believe. I might, if I have time, I might try to figure up one that's probably a little bit more in line with the scriptures of that. A reminder of total depravity's importance. Now, this was a slide that we saw last week, but I want to bring it back to you so that you understand what we're doing. R.C. Sproul, probably the top reformed guy before he passed away, says, if one embraces this aspect of the T and tulip, the total depravity, the rest of the acrostic, U-L-I-P, okay, follows a resistless logic. You have to go with it in order for it to all fit together well, okay? One cannot embrace the T and reject any of the other four letters with any degree of consistency. So as with total depravity, so unconditional election is a logical necessity. It has to work this way. So how did unconditional election come about? How did this doctrine become something that the church embraced? Was it the apostles? Well, no. Actually, uh, a guy who is an Arminianist, uh, sorry, an Arminian, uh, wrote from a historical perspective, it appears to me that Augustine's doctrine, notice who he accredits this to, unconditional election is Augustine's doctrine. It grew out of his thought that depravity was so strong that it could be dealt with only by unconditional election. Now, does everybody remember that situation? Augustine's having a debate with Pelagius. And they're talking about all these things, going back and forth, free will and all this stuff. But there comes to a point of, we don't know what to do with infants. Why is that? Because they believed at that time in the church that you had to be baptized in order to receive forgiveness of sins and the indwelling Holy Spirit. So they've already messed it up from the apostles and made salvation by a work that has to take place. Okay, Lutherans and Catholics, they love that stuff. It fits right in with everything they believe. Bible, no, it's not in there. You can't find it. Okay, But if that was the case, you're already under the guise of a problem. And so Augustine wanted to step into this situation and said, okay, remember his example. Why is it that all these wonderful, well-to-do families are having these children, and before we can get them to the church and get them baptized, they're dying before they get to the waters. Mm -hmm. But these children who are being irresponsibly birthed by these prostitutes in the city, we're able to get them to the waters and we're able to baptize them just fine. Now notice that from Augustine's perspective, from the messed up grid that he's working in, He's got this merit-based, well-to-do system or not-to-do system going on in his mind. How could God do this? Oh, well, here's what it must be. God isn't taking anything of any merit of any person in consideration whatsoever. And by them getting baptized, that proves that they're elect. And if they're not baptized, it proves that they weren't elect. And even if you deal with a consistent Calvinist today, and an infant dies in birth, or it's a miscarriage, or whatever it is, and you ask them about it, they will tell you. It all depends on whether that child was elect or not or whether they went to heaven. They will not give anyone an assurance of salvation for a child that was not responsible for any of that. So it's insane. It gets to the point where it makes God downright insensitive to anything. So that's what you're dealing with. So notice this. 
This doctrine was derived from erroneous conclusions in church history, not the Bible. That's important. I, I This is me personally, and people give me flax. You know, somebody will say something bad about this. That's fine. I don't like church history. I don't. Because it's just a big study of how people did it wrong for years. It really is. And, and if you don't compare it to the Bible... It, it leads people in all kinds of strange ways. This is the reason why, though, we have Catholics. We have, because remember, Augustine is the father of Catholic theology. So we have Catholics, and I believe Lutherans, and we also have some uh, more Reformed Presbyterians. They're all baptizing infants. Why? Because it's all this mark of the election that's supposed to take place. And it all springs from the wrong theological conclusions at the time of Augustine that pushed him to come to this doctrine and bring in his old pagan thinking of how to make sense. So... Now some nerdy stuff, okay? Word studies, yay! And I did this in Strong's. Now one thing I would recommend for sure is if you don't have literal literal word on your phone, that app is free. It's a fantastic app, and it's really easy to search and do word study. Sometimes I'm preparing sermons on my phone, okay? So I mean, that's just how nice it is to be able to mess with all that stuff. Three words that we're going to deal with that deal with the idea of election. The first one is eklegobai, and it means to select or to make a choice. It's used one time in the scriptures that way. To choose 19 times, or to choose out is used one time. It means to pick out or to select. Uh, means in the middle voice to choose for oneself. Not necessarily implying the rejection of what is not chosen, but choosing with the subsidiary ideas of kindness or favor or love that's involved. And I've given you all the passages there that deal with it. The reason why I've given you all the passages is because you can go through and do your own study of this and come to your own conclusions. And that's how you really get to the, to the crux of this. This is a compound word with ek, meaning from or out or after among. And it does have 48 other possibilities that that word that, that could mean. Uh, it's a preposition, but it's added to lego, meaning to lay forth or to relate or to call. And the, the idea means to call out. Uh, when we talk about the word ecclesia, you put that together for the church. It actually means assembly, but if you were to take the two pieces of it and put it together, it means called out ones kind of idea. So the next one is ekloge, and it's the idea of divine selection used in scripture as chosen only once. An election six times. So notice it only occurs seven times in the scripture. That's it. A picking out, a choosing, translated as chosen. In fact, here's a good one for us. Let's take our Bibles and let's open to Acts 9.15 and see how it's used. Acts 9.15. And just real quick, am I too loud for everybody? I know I have the tendency to be loud all the time, so I apologize for that. One thing that you want to do anytime that you're studying the word, and you probably heard me say this before, context determines meaning. Context determines meaning. Well, what in the world does this mean? You can't just use one verse. What is the context? Does anybody know what's going on in Acts chapter 9? <coughs> Big deal. Big deal. So, it is the conversion of Saul to Paul is what it is. He's called Paul later. But this is Saul of Tarsus's conversion time you remember he's riding on the donkey he's got the papers in his hand he's cleared to persecute anybody of the way the christians at that time and jesus shows up speaks to him and knocks him off of his donkey right he says who are you lord I always loved that part and then they send stephen out after him and stephen's like uh god do you know that he like kills people and they're like yeah yeah i know that go and do what i said so he goes and does that and look what it says here. In fact, let's look at 9, but we want to look at verse 13. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go. Now watch this. For he is an ekloge instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul is a chosen instrument of God's. Now, right there, it means he's a vessel of choice, or he's a choice vessel. What does it mean to be a choice vessel? It means the idea of having a special nature unto it. If you read through the rest of Acts, you find out that Paul was the perfect weapon. For God to use. 
because he had a dual citizenship going on. He would be trained in the best school in the area at that time, and he could argue his way out of a steel box if he needed to. He was a smart, smart cookie that God was able to use. So notice, I want you to notice one thing in this passage. Notice, notice that this passage doesn't say anything about the fact that he was chosen for salvation. That's not what was said here. What we're told is that he is a chosen instrument of mine. Why? He is going to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. He doesn't say, I've chosen him to go to heaven when he dies. I've chosen him for salvation. I've chosen him for justification. I've chosen him not to go to hell or I've chosen him to go to hell. He doesn't say any of that stuff. He is chosen for a task that's been set in front of him. He has a destiny that has to be fulfilled that the Lord has prepared for him to do. Okay? Now watch this, eclectos, it means to select, chosen out, or by implication, a favorite. It's used as chosen 16 times, it's used as elect 7 times. Thayer, really good Greek lexicon, notes that the word, word can also speak to being the best of its kind or class, excellent, or preeminent. You talk about David's 600 chosen men, well that can very well be translated in the Hebrew, 600 choice Men, they were chosen for a reason. He didn't come in and bring in the wimpy guys and was like, defend my honor. That's not what happened. He chose them because they had skill or strength or battle experience or something. He chose them on purpose because of what was valuable in there for the use of the task at hand. And there we have all the scriptures for that. Now, again, I encourage you with the literal word app when you find these. It's got a little thing on there where you can click on it and find every instance and read through them all. It's very, very helpful. We're going to look at some of these later on. So Gordon Olson, very good guy, uh, has a really good book out called Beyond Calvinism and Arminianism. Okay, it's a really good book. Uh, I can't remember. He wrote one that was more of like a, a common person's version of the book, but and I can't remember what it's called. This is a great book. There's nothing wrong with getting this book. But I, I really respect him because he came to the conclusion of saying, this doesn't make sense. And so since it doesn't make sense, I need to back up and study it all out for myself. And so this is an unfolding of how he studied it all out for himself and the conclusions he came from. He writes that the secular Greek usage of the verb had to do with electing or appointing people to an office or responsibility with an accompanying obligation to fulfill it responsibly. This is most important since democratic elections began in Greece and the word originated in that connection. So he's given you the history, secular usage. Olson quotes Lothar Cohenen, and where would we be without a Lothar Cohenen quote, right? But here's the reason why you want to know this is because of the value it holds in the book that it's found. Colin Brown's New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology. If you're, if you're nerdy and in the slightest way, it's such a valuable book to get because it's not just, here's what this word means. It is, here's what this word means and here's why it means what it means and here's the controversy that surrounds it and here's the etymology that surrounds it. It's one of those things where you sit and you go, I have a lot less, if I can sit here and read through the snore, snore part of what's going on, I have a lot more reasons to want to grasp this word and use it effectively in the Bible. Although these words originate in military vocabulary, by the time of Plato, eclegobai and eclectos are already in use in a political sense referring to elections. In every case, now watch this, is it a matter of electing people to perform a certain task or administer a certain office? It is always, however, accompanied by some kind of obligation or task concerned with the well-being of all the other members of the community. So anytime that word is used in a secular means, it's always about there's a task to perform, there's a service that needs to be employed, there's some sort of calling that's out ahead that you need to go into, or something. But it's always got a task or an administration situation surrounding it. In the Septuagint, everybody know what the Septuagint is? It's the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Okay? Then the Septuagint, the word is derived from the Hebrew word, bahar. And I looked up Bahar today, and I was going through all 162 uses of the word Bahar in the Old Testament. Man, it was awesome. Okay? But here's what I found. Not one use in the Old Testament has anything to do with being chosen or elected to go to heaven when you die. Not one time. It's never there. The participle forms are Bahur and Bahir and used to describe specially chosen elite troops. Cohen notes that electos also appears a number of times for Hebrew roots connoting loveliness, 
preciousness, or excellent condition. In other words, a choice person. She has a choice smile. That is, Ferris Bueller said, I love driving your dad's car. It's so choice. I'll always remember that for <laughs> Ferris Bueller's day off. Okay? But here the adjective does not express the fact of being chosen, but in a wider sense, factors already present which make choice likely. Now see, this, is, this, this rubs the Calvinist the wrong way. And it's really hard to argue with this guy because of the book his stuff is found in. It's an authoritative book on how to use New Testament theological words. So but notice what he's saying. It's not the idea that God said, mm, you, 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 bye. He doesn't do that. It's not just kind of arbitrary. It makes me really happy to save Brian and Marianne. Boy, that brings me joy. Well, I'm just not happy about you getting saved. You know, it, it doesn't do that. It separates from the idea of salvation altogether. It's completely disassociated. And it can actually have the tendency of taking into account factors of the person in order to get something accomplished. Now, if election is to a task or an office or a service that needs to be done, that only makes sense that you would want people with some sort of training, background, uh, heritage, something that's going to get something done for the sake of the Lord. But if it's unto salvation, you've now said, well, if anybody's chosen because of something in them that makes that happen, we've now violated that situation and it's become about merit. Hello, come on in. Come on in. Please, let me get you some handouts. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I, I, I what? It's okay. Thank you. Okay, we started, no, we started at six. It's okay. What, what page are we on real quick? Page five. Page five of these. So it's okay. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. And if you missed anything, all the audio is on the uh, is on the website. So it's totally okay. Come on in. So the idea is, as long, if, you, if, if election doesn't have anything to do with salvation, then taking factors of the person in mind for what they're chosen for totally makes sense. Because they're not elected to salvation, they're elected to service or a task to accomplish. So, continuing word studies. What Conan is getting at is that the Greek translation of the Hebrew word signify two things. Number one, that people or groups are considered chosen to a task, obligation, or responsibility, and not to go to heaven when you die. That's not how the Bible uses the word at all. Number two, that this choosing to a task, obligation, or responsibility is based upon some factor that makes this choosing likely, meaning that the people are in some way qualified for the task. Let's see how this is true in the Old Testament. Let's take our Bibles and let's turn to Exodus 17. We'll look at verse 9. We want to consider a little bit of context around it, of course, just to know where we're at and what we're doing. Exodus chapter 17. You got it? Exodus chapter 17, verse 9. Let's read verse 8, since that's the beginning of that paragraph in the, in the manuscript. Then Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose men for us to go to heaven when they die. Is that what it says? It doesn't say that, does it? Notice what he says. Choose men for us and go out. Fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. What were these men chosen for? To fight. To fight. That's the task. Pretty, pretty simple, isn't it? Oh, my bad. Sorry, we got to go back. How do I go back? Boom. There we go. Okay, sorry. Exodus 18. Let's turn over to that. Look at verse 25. It's probably just a page for you. Exodus 8, 25. Let's look at verse 24 first. So Moses listened to his father-in-law. Everybody remember this one when Jethro was like, you're doing too much. Some of us need to hear that now. Notice, so Moses listened to his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men out of all of Israel to go to heaven when they die. Notice it doesn't say that, does it? Notice he chose able men out of all of Israel and made them heads over the people, leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. What were they chosen for? To responsibility. They're to be overseers over the people of Israel. Everybody see how that works? How about the next one? Deuteronomy 7. Or as Tom Janney likes to say, dude, you're on to me. Seven. That joke never gets old for me. I know it does for you, but I'm still going to talk about it. Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 through 8. Who would like to read verses 6 through 8? Let's have some people read. 
For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Okay, notice that. They were chosen. Why? Because what? Well, it says because God... Not not because of all other things, but because God loved them. Yes, notice in this situation, they were chosen, not because of anything in them. And so he said, it's not because you were mighty in people. In fact, when they were chosen, who were they? For one person, yeah. Abram. He's a pagan worshiping the moon over in Babylon. And they call him out to come over to a land that he's never been to before and start making all these promises and these covenants with them. So notice it didn't have, in this situation, didn't have anything to do with merit of them. But does it say that they were chosen to go to heaven when they die? It does not say that at all. It doesn't say that at all. Notice, there are people for his own possession out of all the people of the earth. Um, another good one to write next to that, if you want to look at it, is chapter 4 of Deuteronomy, verses 6 through 8. If you just want to put it in your margin or write it to the side. Because he says, you were, chose, you were a chosen people to be a megaphone to the nations, is pretty much what he says. To testify, the nations will come and they'll say, who else has such righteous laws and standards as this? Who else has a God that is amazing as yours? They were meant in order to preach a purpose. It wasn't to go to heaven when they die. How about 2 Samuel 21? This is a good one. We'll look at 2 Samuel 21, and I need an alternate flipper. Uh, Zach, could you be my alternate flipper so we can compare Scripture with Scripture? Sure. I need you to go to 1 Samuel 9.16. So 2 Samuel 21.6 is what we're looking at, and then we'll have... Zach read for us to help clear up the picture. Who wants to read 2 Samuel 21 6? I don't we could we could read verses 1 through 6 and we'd get them to do a whole quandary about what's going on and why did it happen this way. I don't want to entertain that. You can do that in your own personal devotion time. I'm sure it'll spark a lot of interest. But in verse 6, if somebody could just read verse 6 so we could see what it's being talked about. 2 Samuel 21 6. Let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord chose. And the king said, I will give them. Notice, Saul, whom the Lord chose. Zach, if you wouldn't mind, please. 1 Samuel 9 16. About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. And he will deliver my people from the hand of the Philistines. For I have regarded my people, because their cry has come to me. What was Saul chosen for? Go to heaven when he dies? To be king. In fact, he was the first king, first human king of Israel. Notice that's what he was chosen for. So when it refers to Saul as the chosen, that's what it's talking about there in that context. Now look at Psalm 105. And Zach, if you could be my Deuteronomy 4 verses 6 through 9 guy. Psalm 105. It's warm in here. A little bit. It's okay. It's warm. <clears throat> Psalm 105, 37 through 45. This is kind of a lot to get to where we need to, but I want you to get the context. The psalmist is recounting the Exodus event and what happened there. And if you look at verse 37, then he brought them out with silver and gold. And among his tribes, there was not one who stumbled. Egypt was glad when they departed, for the dread of them had fallen upon them. He spread a cloud for a covering and fire to illuminate by night. They asked and he brought quail and satisfied them with the bread of heaven. He opened the rock and water flowed out. It ran in the dry places like a river, for he remembered his holy word with Abraham, his servant. And he brought forth his people with joy, his chosen ones, with a shout, with a, with a joyful shout. He gave them also the lands of the nations, that they might take possession of the fruit of the people's labors, so that they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. Now notice that Israel is called the chosen ones of God. And notice that at the bottom there it says, so that, verse 45, 
they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. Now, we answered this a minute ago, but the question is why. Zach, if you wouldn't mind, read Deuteronomy 4, 6 through 9. So keep them and do them, for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as is the Lord our God, whenever we call on him? Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I am setting before you today? Only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen, and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life. But make them known to your sons and your grandsons. Notice uh, the nations were to take notice of how God worked with Israel. That's what they were called to. That's why they were chosen. Were to be an example of his grace to, to, to pagans is pretty much what it was. Isaiah 41. Let's turn over there to Isaiah I didn't think you guys would want to go through all 162 instances of Bihar, but we're going to look at a couple. Isaiah 41, verse 1. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend, You, whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its remotest parts and said, You are my servant. I have chosen you and not rejected you. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your Elohim. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Notice Israel again, chosen. Chosen to go to heaven when they die? That's not what it says. Notice they're chosen by God. And chosen mainly because of the promise that was made to Abraham. Last one here, if you turn over the next chapter. Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4. Behold, my servant, speaking of the Messiah, whom I uphold, my chosen one, and whom my soul delights. The Messiah is God's chosen one, which means before the foundation of the world, before Jesus had ever done anything good or bad, he decided to elect him to salvation. Is that what that means? See, the Calvinist definition doesn't work when you get Jesus in the mix. We're going to see that here in a little bit. But just thinking Old Testament-wise about what they say an acceptable definition of election is, it doesn't work. I've put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice, and he will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. Here's a question. What has this servant been chosen to? Chosen for his final task to be judged? What would you say, Brian? Just to bring the message. Notice he's been chosen to reign. This is talking about as a servant, he will still be the ruler of all things. He'll bring forth justice. Not disheartened or crushed, he'll establish justice on the earth. And the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. He was chosen to be king. Jesus was elected to be king. So, it is with the understanding of Israel being considered a chosen nation and the Lord Jesus being God's chosen that we must ask the question, in what way have they been chosen by God? That's always a question you ask. There's only two choices. The Calvinist view is, God decided before the foundation of the world whom he would choose to be saved, based on nothing that the person would do, good or bad, in their life, and allowed for the rest of those not chosen to be destined to the lake of fire for all eternity without any possibility of avoiding that eternal destiny. This would mean that the nation of Israel was selected for God's saving purposes. That doesn't seem to be what Scripture teaches. A more biblical view would be, the choosing of the nation Israel was for a specified task or obligation that needed to be fulfilled and came about by means of supernatural birth. For instance, Abraham was as good as dead as far as bearing children was concerned. And God still caused this elderly couple to bring forth Isaac, the child of promise. Isaac was not chosen out of an unnamed mass of people for justification, but born by miraculous means as a fulfillment of the covenant promises made to Abraham. I thought Mary Mary Severson was working down in the office today. She comes in on Wednesday when pretty much nobody else is here to work. I thought about going down there and ask her when her and Bob were expecting kids the next time. (laughs) why is that well i was thinking i was putting together what we were going to be talking about tonight i was really thinking about that how miraculous that was that 
that, that they were able to have children and all that. Well, what were they chosen to do in that situation? What's perpetuating forward the promise that God made? So notice it's not about heaven and hell situation. So here's an Old Testament study that, that you could do for just the word. Always start in the Old Testament, move into the New Testament. Whether you're doing chose, choose, chosen, doesn't matter. Choosing, it'll all fall under that head. If you have the literal word app, you type in Genesis 6-2. That's the first time that this word occurs in the Old Testament. Place your finger on the word choose. Does anybody have the app? Anybody have that? Okay. If, every, if everybody will look up at the screen, I will show you. Okay. Here we go. So, right here, Old Testament, Genesis 6, 2. Okay. It says, da, 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 whomever they chose. I put my finger here, and a little box pops up down here and gives me the definition in Hebrew of everything that's going on. But it's got this little tab right here. It's found 162 times in the Old Testament. So I put my finger on that, and it gives me all of them that I have. I can search it by Pentateuch, history, wisdom, and poetry, major prophets, minor prophets, doesn't matter. I can go down and click on any one that I want to and read it in the surrounding context to come to a biblical conclusion about what election means. So that is a way to deal with it. You now have numerous instances to research. You always ask the simple question. Chosen for what? What is it they've been chosen to? Here's our good friend R.C. Sproul. Calvinism teaches not just election, but unconditional election. Meaning that the electing grace that God gives to those whom he saves is not based on some condition that he sees in them. Now that works against some of what we've seen about election so far. But remember, he's talking about salvation. Right? But it is sovereignly, there's that word again, Sovereignly based in the good pleasure of his will. He saves whoever makes him happy. Now, there's a problem. Wait! Doesn't God predestine everything? Isn't that kind of the, the push? God predestines everything. Let's turn to Romans 9. And let's look at this. Romans chapter 9. Now remember, the whole push is, is that unconditional election is not based, God's choice is not based on anything that anybody has done. Okay? So he chooses to go to heaven. But if God predestines everything, then doesn't that mean he's predestined what people do? Everybody see that? How that's different? Now watch what the text says. Chapter 9, verse 1. I'm telling the truth in Christ. This is Paul. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. Why, Paul? Why are you so upset? Here he goes. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, okay? And that means to be banned or to be excommunicated. But the word separated has been added in there. And separated is the idea of spiritual death. That's not what Paul's talking about. Paul's not saying, I would just as soon go to hell for this other situation to happen. He's not saying that. He knows that's not a possibility, and I don't believe he's speaking the hyperbole there. That word separated was added, and we know it was because of the italics. I could be accursed from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers, and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. Notice he says, I'm so upset because the Jews are not coming to faith in Christ. I'm, I'm distraught over this. They have all of this Old Testament knowledge, and they're still not believing in their Messiah who has already come. So what's the problem? Look at verse 6. He answers it. But it's not as though the word of God has failed. If anything happened in this situation, God's word is not to blame. Okay? Look what it says. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Now he's going to explain that again. Nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. But, now watch this. He quotes the Old Testament. Through Isaac, your descendants will be named. Well, who was born before Isaac to Abraham? Ishmael. Ishmael. Was Ishmael chosen to go to the lake of fire when he dies? No. Was Isaac chosen to go to heaven when he dies? No. Think about that real quick. That is not what the situation of choosing Isaac over Ishmael 
had to do with whatsoever. Why is it? The text tells you. Verse 8, that is, it is not the children of the flesh. Just because Jews have babies doesn't mean that they are the ones chosen. The question is, chosen for what? Here it is. It's not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. What promise? You might know. The Abrahamic promise. Remember, I'll give you a land. I'll give you seed. I'll give you blessing. Remember that? Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15. So if you come in the line of the promise, the promise didn't go through Ishmael. It went through Isaac. That was the promised way that this was going to be fulfilled. It wasn't about, and only you will go to heaven when you die, but Ishmael, your stepbrother, is going to go, you know, or, or go to hell, and you're going to go to heaven. That's not how this is worded at all. It's all about the fulfilling of God's promise as he works out his eternal program. So look what it says in verse 9. For, here's an explanation. This is the word of promise. In other words, let me tell you what that is. Here it is. He quotes it. This is from Genesis 18. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. Sarah will have a son, not Hagar will have a son. Hagar's already had a son. That didn't work out very well. In fact, if you compare scripture from 15, chapter 15 of Genesis to 16, you find that God did not talk to Abraham for 13 years because of what he did. They just did not communicate. That's a pretty serious situation. So now God's pretty much like, now that you're over this trying to help me out phase, let me do what I do. I'm going to give you kids. Here we go. It's going to be so notice by this time next year, Sarah's going to have a son. Verse 10, and not only this, but there was Rebekah also. Now, Rebekah was whose wife? Isaac's. Isaac's wife. So now you've got the child of promise, Isaac, and now you've got his wife, Rebekah. And what's going on there with that? Notice, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac, why do they bring him up? Because he's the child of promise here, who God's bringing his plan about. For, through, for though the twins were not yet born, okay, they haven't been born yet, and had not done anything good or bad. Ha, there's your, there's your unconditional election. They haven't done anything of merit, so there it is. We've got it. Okay, now watch this. So that God's purpose according to his choice, and some of your Bibles will say, his purpose according to election will stand. And that's what the word means. It's exactly what it means. We're not apologizing for that. Not because of works, because you can't have any merit in it, because of him who calls. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger. We're talking about Jacob and Esau. Esau will serve Jacob. And notice, everybody gets messed up on this. Just as it's written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now, real quick, let's address that real quick. This whole thing, Jacob I love, but Esau I have hated, is quoted in Malachi. Okay? This is quoted in Malachi because since the Genesis time, those two groups had had time to develop into nations generations over. And Esau's nation became a detestable nation who were God-haters. That's the problem. And that's the reason why God responds so strongly against that. He's not saying at the time the twins were in the womb, I hate Esau and I love Jacob. That's not what happened whatsoever. This comes at the very last book of the Old Testament. So we have to ask this question. Having read this, we have to ask the Calvinists this question. Notice, for though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, pay attention to that, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand not because of works, but because of him who calls. Here's the question. Wouldn't hadn't not done anything good or bad only make sense if God had not already predetermined their good and bad? I mean, isn't one of the great problems we saw last week was when God predestines everything or because he's sovereign over everything or he orchestrates everything, people are sinners because he's determined it to be so and God actually determines sin. Isn't that a problem in their system? Why would Paul bring up before they had done anything good or bad to make his point here? If them not doing any good or bad doesn't matter to the Calvinist. Because the Calvinist is wrong and the Bible is right. And the election is not to salvation. The election is to fulfill the task or purpose that God has put before them in his word. That's the reason why. So, contradictory conclusions like this have resulted in two major mistakes in handling the scriptures. Number one, not everything's about salvation in scripture. It's just not. And when we see the word saved, salvation, saved, that kind of stuff. Don't automatically think, go to heaven when you die. Read the context. It's a major mistake that people make. Number two, the Calvinist understanding of sovereignty is not biblical. Period. It's just not. Jason. Well, I mean, they put a lot of stake in 15. You see stuff short of 15. I will have the, mercy on who I have mercy in. Yes. Yes. But here's the thing. Can't God do that? Yeah. 
And what's he talking about in that situation? I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will harden who I harden. Who's he talking about there? Does anybody remember? Pharaoh. Pharaoh. Yeah. Go back and read Pharaoh's account. Go back and read Exodus from chapter 1 to about chapter 12. If you just read through that section, God has an initial conversation with Moses. Remember the burning bush, remove your feet, it's holy ground, the whole thing. And he says, I want to send you out to Pharaoh. And Moses making all these excuses. He's got five excuses he wants to make about why he can't go and why he's not good enough and why he's not that good. No, Moses, you've been chosen for a task to fulfill. And so he's going to send him out to do that. And he says, but I know that Pharaoh's not going to listen to me, and so I'll harden his heart. Now notice it doesn't say, you go talk to him, I'm going to already harden his heart so that he won't listen to you. That's not what it says. And so when you go, you read the text, Moses goes, it says, and Pharaoh hardened his heart against the word of the Lord. Second time he goes, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. Third time, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. Fourth time, and God hardened his heart. God does not harden Pharaoh's heart until after he's had three times to respond to a prophet being sent to him. And this is how God works with people. God gives a window of grace for people to respond. And people have the choice of humbling themselves and responding to God in that way. Now remember, we're not talking about heaven and hell issues here. We're really not. We're talking about Pharaoh making the decision to let people go. If you remember Pharaoh's first response, who is this God that I should listen to him? That was, that was Egyptian culture. Why? Who was God in that culture? Pharaoh. Pharaoh. Pharaoh was God. Nobody else. Who is your God that I should even pay attention? And if you remember when we went through this in the Foundational Framework series, all of the plagues that took place were battles against the false gods, the demons who were running Egypt. And God just dismantled every one of them piece by piece. No problem. Didn't, didn't bat an eye to do any of it. So Moses goes, preaches the word, as is told, let my people go. Yahweh says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, no, 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 no. Then God says, fine. I'll harden his heart. I'll harden his heart. I'll harden his heart. I'll use him for a destructive purpose now to accomplish my will rather than a peaceful purpose. How much different? Would it have been if Pharaoh said, you know what? I need to humble myself and let the people go. It's wrong what we're doing to them. But greed, power, money, those types of things won't allow people to do that. Sometimes sin hardens the heart. And when that's the case, God says, fine, if that's the way you want to go, that's where we'll go. Now, let's not be surprised by that. Romans chapter 1. Because they wouldn't acknowledge God, they wouldn't honor him or give thanks to him. God gave them up to a depraved mind. God gave them up to sinful passions. God gave them up to do what they ought not to do. Why? Because they had the chance to respond numerous times and dismissed it. This is why the results of preaching the gospel for us are not based on us. We're faithful messengers, but we don't cause the results. People have the opportunity to respond, the choice to respond. So yes, I hope that clears that up. Well, I, I mean, I was just saying, you know, they really like all of Romans 9 here, you know, talking about um, in verse 18, he'll have mercy on who he desires, and he'll harden who, whom he desires. Yes. And the potter, you know, he can make one pile of clay for good, honorable use, and one for common use. Yes. So, you know, that, that they just keep going back to that and saying, these. this proves what we're saying, that God God chooses one for good and one for bad. And Yeah, well, the, the point that he's making there is God can choose whom he desires to choose for his purpose. But the purpose that's going on here is not the salvation of people. 9, 10, and 11 are dealing with Israel. Remember, that's Paul's. That's why Paul's so upset. Why is Israel not coming to faith in Christ? What is the deal? And then, well, the Reformed people twist that around. They say, well, the reason is, is because we're all Israel. The church is the new Israel. The church is spiritual Israel. Well, he's not dealing with physical Israel anymore because they were so full of idolatry. God's done with the Jewish people, and now all their promises have transferred to us. It's odd because when you say, well, have their curses transferred to us too? They'll be like, oh, no, 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 that's for them. That's for Jews. It's not for us. So I understand why we get the good stuff but not the bad stuff according to them. That's weird. But yes, you're exactly right. What's that? So is, in both cases, is it a stubborn pride that you don't want to admit that you're, you know... I think that's really what it boils down to, yeah. 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 Don't want to give up on your own stuff. I, I think that God works so intimately in desiring people to come to salvation that he allows or sets up circumstances in their life that is meant to get attention. And at that moment, you I mean, think about it. Jesus told us, we're going to deal with this when we deal with irresistible grace, but Jesus told us in John 14, the Holy Spirit is out to 
I convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Holy Spirit is always doing that all the time. Every single person is convicted in the entire world of their sin, their need for righteousness, and the fact that judgment is going to come. And everybody has eternity questions in that situation. I mean, the Holy Spirit's already doing a work on people's lives. He's already working in everybody's life. That's how much God loves people. As he's already getting that out there to try to get their attention, prick their conference, uh, conference, conscience, soften their heart, all of those things. You know, Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. We're going to deal with that too when we deal with irresistible grace. But ever since Jesus has been crucified, there's been this drawing of God, of him drawing people. That's what the Bible says. So another thing real quick, just to go along with what Jason was saying there. If you look at the end of Romans 9, when Paul sums up his conclusion... He, he tells you, remember how he said it's not because the word of God has failed? Everybody remember that? He tells you what the problem is. Because the Jews refuse to believe. They're trying to earn righteousness by works instead of by faith. And that's the problem. So, if you read that whole thing through, yes sir. Forgive me, remind me your name, I'm so sorry. Tom. Tom, forgive me Tom, I'm well, sorry. I have a question about Go for it. Um, the premise that no one comes to Christ unless a Christian has prayed for him. And does that enter into this thought? I don't think so, and you're not going to like my answer. So I apologize up front. Well, but, I, but I will I'm be honest with you. I, I stand for that, but I, I, I question whether that was true. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll make this statement, and then don't throw anything at me. Let me explain, okay? <laughs> okay? The Bible never tells us to pray for the salvation of lost people. Never. Oh. Not one time. Paul does repeatedly tell us to pray for open doors to share the gospel for boldness to share the gospel, for God to give us clarity in sharing the gospel, that we should speak as we ought to speak in sharing the gospel. But I think it's really interesting that God never tells Christians, pray for that lost person that they'll come to faith in Christ. It never happens. The closest we get is pray for our government and our leaders so that we can live a peaceful and tranquil life. That's as close as we get. But as far as that somebody would would believe the gospel, we never do that. And I think the reason I think the reason why the New Testament is really amazingly silent on that is because the person has the choice of whether they respond or not to the gospel. The prayers that we see are that the church would be evangelistic to go share the gospel with lost people. We don't see that we would pray that they would receive the gospel. And I think the reason is is because since Christ was crucified, he's been drawing people and also uh uh, the Holy Spirit's convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. God's already out there doing the pre-work. He's getting the ground ready. But he needs workers to go out in the field. Why? Because the harvest, or, or, or the seeds need to be planted so that there can be a harvest that comes in. And, 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 but, but as far as praying for people to receive Christ, and, I, and I've heard those stories and things about, you know, we prayed for that person for 20 years if they came to faith in Christ. And I don't want to doubt that or, 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 or speak badly about that or whatever, but if you, if you read the entire Old and New Testament, you will never find one time that there's a prayer for somebody to come to faith in Christ. There's just not there. And, 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 and you know, there's something about that, that that kind of doesn't sit well with me because I grew up in a traditional backwoods Southern Baptist church where you just prayed for the salvation of every person. You know, kind of think that's just what you did. But that seems to be more of maybe a denominational connection than a biblical one. So when I first learned that, that was really hard for me to get over and say, well, is that true? And then the question was, well, what does the Bible say in relation to lost people about prayer? And it was all things that I needed God's uh, supernatural ability so that I can go and share the gospel with people. And it really set the emphasis more on me sharing rather than them receiving. So, yeah. Do we ever pray for a heart to be softened or for the situation that we know someone is in for that to soften their heart? We can, but I don't know that the Bible says that either. either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know that it does. Trying to, you know, work through that one too because there are people that I know that are just holding God at arm's length and I keep praying for their ears to be opened and their hearts to be softened and I don't know if that's I don't know that it is. I'll tell you this. Something that is startling to think about. A while back after we got down with the foundational framework stuff on Sunday mornings, we did the very depressing death parade series where we went through Romans 1, and it was really, really depressing. It was really dark. But if you read through Romans 1 and you pay attention to what's going on in our society, it is fitting just like this of what happens. 
And right now, you know, people say it's very pessimistic to say we're under God's judgment. We are. We're, uh, the, America is under the passive wrath of God because everything we see happening right now, God is saying, I'm going to take my hands off your nation and let you guys do what you want to. And look at everything that we're dealing with. It is a, it is a monstrosity of what this country used to be. And it's only happened, it's only really started to snowball in the last few years. That's unbelievable. But that also makes me recognize that the time is coming for the rapture. So I'm anticipating that. But So yeah, sorry to burst a bubble. I hope I didn't. But it is something to maybe maybe chew on and think about and pray about. You know, well, God, as far as evangelism is concerned, what is the responsibility here to, to pray? You know, and, and, and I, we need to be sharing the gospel more personally. I think we need to be anticipating the work of the Holy Spirit to lead us to share the gospel with people. You know, God, where do you want me to be? Where do you want me to work? Uh, how do you want me to say, you know, give me everything that I need in order to present your word clearly. And I guarantee he'll open doors in order to make that happen. We need to be sharing the gospel more with people. They're lost. They're going to the lake of fire. We've got to tell them about Christ. So absolutely. So I hope I hope you come back in two weeks when we have this class again. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I have a question. Go for it. How would you then pray for your children? Um, you know, just like I would anybody else, you know, except probably more so. Well, but, just in terms of like, um, walking with the Lord and like uh, like my I know my heart's desire is that my children would know mm-hmm. the Lord and that they would just to follow the Lord in their life and you know what's interesting is is I, I came across that about that the Bible doesn't have anything about praying for the lost in the scriptures before we had kids and so I've never prayed for the salvation of my children and I know that may sound weird the things that I have prayed for them is Lord please shield them from evil while they're young you know, uh, there, there's so much craziness that goes on to young kids today, and I've prayed for them to be shielded. But one thing that I also did was I was very intentional about sharing the gospel with Nathaniel. You know, Zechariah is getting to where he understands. So when I rock him at night, the two things that I'm I'm, talk, I'm talking to him about, repeating to him is, you know, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and for God so loved the world, He gave His only Son. Whoever believes in Him has eternal life, and He'll go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So whatever that is, for <laughs> somebody's almost two, they're getting it. But, you know, Nathaniel came to faith in Christ probably six to nine months ago now. And it was simply by taking time to explain the gospel. But I started the same way with him. You know, my wife and I were just sharing. We started, you know, number one, he needs to know who God is. God's the creator. In the beginning, God created heaven's here. And then we begin just having conversation. You know, God is just a regular tapestry in everything that we talk about. And we always try to relate every instance that we can back to God. We always try to, you know, if we're outside, it's a beautiful day. We're always like, well, you know, God did this. God gave us a great day. So we're trying to make him understand that Christianity is not in some, you know, rubber-made box that you keep on a, on a shelf and bring out on occasion. He, he, his truth is total truth for all time. And, and, and we had the opportunity. We numerously shared the gospel with uh, Nathaniel. Writing kids tracks, that kind of thing. Had little booklets that explained it. He would ask questions about Jesus. And even if they were hard questions to answer because it dealt with blood and death and that kind of stuff, we still answered them. You know, I think that's 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 one thing that, that my wife and I have agreed upon before we had kids. We'll never lie to our kids. It doesn't do any good. Because if, we, if, if they know that we've lied to them about something, why should they trust us on whatever the next thing is? And so we'll always share the gospel. And we'll do the same with Zechariah. Yeah, our hope is that they'll come to faith in Christ. I don't doubt that, whatever. But we're also putting them in an environment where we want to make sure if they don't come to faith in Christ, it's because that they didn't want to. It's not that they didn't know. It's not that they were ignorant. It's not that they didn't understand some of the finer details. Mm-hmm. And it's the fact that they chose to, to have a hard heart about it or they chose to be disobedient about it. But I also think that there's a point about that that, that also couples with discipline in the home. And how that works and whether they understand that, that, you know, something simple as you don't hit your brother. You know, that Zechariah's big thing now is hauling off and smacking the tar out of his brother in some way. And the thing you can't do anything because he's not even two yet. You know, so it's not like he's punching back. But, but make him realize the consequences for actions and things. Well, ultimately, why do we do consequences for actions? Because there's a standard of truth and to disobey is to reap further consequences. Well, blow that up on an eternal scale. What are we dealing with? We're dealing with either heaven or the lake of fire. So those principles still translate, I think, and I think they set, they, they model physical concepts that kids can later, hopefully, when they start to think beyond concrete terms, can associate to the gospel. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question. Um, 
Remind me your name too. Sharon. Tom and Sharon. Yeah. Tom, and Sharon. Tom and Sharon. If okay. I forget, you guys need to come to the new covers. I think that's for everybody. I can't remember the name. When I think Forgive of raising me. our children, because we're old now, the verse I hung to was, Delight thyself in the Lord, mm -hmm. and he will give you the desires of your heart. Mm -hmm. And that was our desire, mm -hmm. that they would come to know him. But our responsibility was delight thyself in the Lord. Yes, absolutely. That was our promise. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's huge. When God is the main thing for the parents, they can't help but to learn that. They can't help but to see, you know, that, that constant relationship being tended to, that kind of thing, you know. And, and I do get that. That's what, what I mean. We do that in our, our home. Please understand, I'm not saying you don't. But the prayer, could be taken but the praying for, for our kids, because like we pray about their spouses someday. Mm -hmm. They would be blessed with a spouse that sure. honors the Lord first. And, but if it's, it's not written directly in Scripture, is it? not wrong to pray for those things. I would never discourage you from praying for the salvation of your children. Never. But but if, if you want the flat answer, the flat answer is I can't find it in the Bible. I just can't. So I, I wish I could. Because I like the idea of it. But I think that because I like the idea of having a hand in it and I'm a control freak, so maybe that's the reason. <laughs> but, you know, ultimately it has nothing to do with me. So That kind of backfires. It does backfire all the time. Yes, it does. So, all right. So, some things on the sovereignty of God. Now, again, just so you know, this paper is available up here. It deals with some of the things about the sovereignty of God and, and just issues that we should be aware of. If you want to take one of the papers, you can. They're just going to be sitting up here. We have to deal with the issue of the sovereignty of God because the sovereignty of God is always put forward as the reason for unconditional election. God can choose every, whoever he wants to because he's sovereign. And sometimes sovereign is used as the trump card to put out there in order to quell any replies or any, any you know, uh, uh, any, anything that anybody would have to say that might be differently than that. Um, so here we go. The implications of misunderstanding sovereignty. Now this is our, our Arminian friend again. In Calvinism, the central truth to be reckoned with is that everything else must harmonize with the sovereignty of God. Now, here's the reason why that might be a little concerning is because sovereignty has been elevated above all the other attributes of God. It's not that he's all of these things perfectly together. For some reason, sovereignty gets harped on and therefore elevated to a level that probably it shouldn't. Uh, the Calvinistic concept of the sovereignty of God, as I see it, is developed along the lines of cause and effect. This is why Calvinists have a special difficulty dealing with the origin of sin. Now, their definition of sovereign makes sin a sticky issue. Let's see how that works. Here's John Piper. It isn't just that God manages to turn the evil aspect of our world to good for those who love him. It is rather he himself brings about or causes these evil aspects for his glory and his people's good. This includes as incredible and as unacceptable as it may certainly seem, God having brought about or caused the Nazis' brutality in Birkenau and Auschwitz, as well as the terrible killings of Dennis Rader and even the sexual molestation of a young child. That's what John Piper says in the book, Suffering in the Sovereignty of God. Now think about that somebody comes to you if something horrific like that happened, and they're asking, what does God have to say about this? And imagine that your response could possibly be, well, God caused this for your ultimate good and his glory. What does that tell you about God? He wouldn't be holy then, would he? He wouldn't be holy. Would he truly be the perfection of love? No. He wouldn't be a God worth worshiping. He wouldn't be a God worth worshiping. Why? Here's, a, here's an interesting thing to think about. Because by this definition, God needs sin to get his will accomplished. Everybody see that? Yeah. See, and that's the Calvinist dilemma. It exists. We can't deny it in experience. And the Bible talks all about it. So how do we reconcile that with a God who determines everything that happens down to the finest minutia of detail? How do we reconcile that? Well, we can only go one way if we're going to be consistent in our logical system. God causes sin. God is the ultimate cause of sin. That's how they come to it. Here's another one from our good friend. 
So when I say that everything that exists, including evil, is ordained by an infinitely holy and all-wise God to make the glory of Christ shine more brightly, I mean that one way or the other, God sees to it that all things serve to glorify his Son. Doesn't matter what it is. Now, if you've ever been in a situation where you've gone to a jeweler and the jeweler is really trying to schmooze you on getting a diamond, what does he do in order to do that? He puts down that black cloth, doesn't he? And he puts it out there and makes sure it's reflecting off the lights real nice so you can see just how shiny it is against the possible darkest background. Well, here's what they're saying. God creates the dark background so that you'll see the diamond more clearly. But remember, that leads to a problem. That means that God needs the dark background in order for Christ to be seen more clearly. Is that the case? I don't think it is. So, let's talk to our friend John Calvin on the extent of the sovereignty of God. From this, it is easy to conclude how foolish and frail is the support of divine justice afforded by the suggestion that evils come to be not by God's will, but merely by his permission. In other words, the God... If you try to make the argument that God doesn't cause sin, he just allows for it to happen, you're wrong, is what he's saying. Of course, so far as they are, there are, they are evils, which men perpetrate with their evil mind, as I shall show in greater detail shortly, I admit that they are not pleasing to God. So God is allowing things that aren't pleasing to him to go on, okay? But it's quite frivolous refuge to say that God permits them when Scripture shows him not only willing but the author of them. So the very things that are completely unpleasing to God, John Calvin says, it's not just that he allows them, even though they're clearly evils, people do them and he doesn't like them. He actually causes them and he's the one that they originate from for people to do. Whoa. Yes, sir. So 1 John 1, 5 means what? To Whatever Calvinist wants it to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and the whole fact, you know, God is, God does not sin, nor does he tempt anyone with sin, you know, that whole thing. Yeah, yeah. All right. I, I don't know. So, but it's from his book, just so you know, conter- concerning the eternal predestination of God, and you can get it on Kindle. I think it's actually free. So, the Westminster Shorter Catechism. What are the decrees of God? The answer is, the decrees of God are his eternal purpose, according to the counsel of his will, whereby for his own glory he hath foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. Now, it's interesting. I'm going I'm to show you this book. This book is called Chosen to Serve by Sean Lazar. This is probably the best explanation of a biblical, biblically grounded view of election that I've ever seen in my life, ever. You can get it on Amazon. And this quote is out of this book. Uh, I actually let Pastor Steve borrow this, and I had to ask it back from him because he had it so long. And when I got it back, he had marked all every page and all the way from beginning to end. So I think he just assumed I gave him the book or whatever, which I probably need to get him a copy. But after I gave Pastor Steve this book, he said, I've changed my view on this issue. I agree with this book. I gave it to Chuck and Connie. They changed their view on this issue. I gave it to Mary Severson, and she wouldn't talk to me for two weeks <laughs> because it messed up her her carefully planned framework understanding of God so much that she had never thought of it this way from the scriptures. And uh, we really haven't talked about it much since then. But she'll just say, "Well, it's an interesting book." So, uh, but I, I encourage you to get it and read it. It's worth it. This is the author, Sean Lazar. He writes. That definition of sovereignty makes God the author of sin, very plainly, okay? Whatever comes to pass. If God causes everything to come to pass and sin comes to pass, then God causes sin. There's no avoiding that conclusion. I don't see that position supported by Scripture. Instead, I would say that God is sovereign in the sense of being in charge of all things, but not necessarily being in deterministic control of all things. He is in charge, not in control. What does that mean? It means God gives people freedom, real freedom. We might call it libertarian freedom is how we might understand it. But that freedom is not absolute. It has limits set by God. Moreover, God can override our choices when it suits his purposes. But most of the time, our freedom is real, meaning God does not unilaterally cause what we do or think. For example, God does not cause us to sin, but rightly holds us accountable for the sins we freely choose to commit. I think that's probably the best balanced understanding of the sovereignty of God that I know of. 
This is interesting because this guy, L. Russ Bush, he's one of those guys that you would never want to philosophically tangle with. He is a smart, 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 smart Christian. This is a long quote, but just go with me. Apparently, God is sovereignly chosen to allow and thus to create a reality within which some real freedom exists within limits. But the future is not, therefore, open-ended. The reason one knows that God has not determined everything is that God's will is not always done. Isn't that the prayer? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why would you pray that if his will is already being done here? God is not willing that any should perish, but some do. God is not a sinner and does not cause sin, but sin occurs nonetheless. Adam was given the choice to eat or not eat, an existential and morally significant choice. Adam, not God, was responsible for the choice that he made. His choice was real, but there was not an unlimited range of possible futures. So it is with all choices and futures. So it is. And my good friend A.W. Tozer, God sovereignly decreed that man should be free to exercise moral choice, and man from the beginning has fulfilled that decree by making his choice between good and evil. When he chooses to do evil, he does not thereby countervail the sovereign will of God, but fulfills it, inasmuch as the eternal decree decided not which choice the man should make, but that he should be free to make it. In other words, God isn't surprised when somebody chooses to sin. It's not like, oh, I'm totally unprepared for what to do now. God never does that. It never surprises him. He knows every possible future based on our choices that could possibly occur. And he's perfectly prepared for all of them. So the crucial question is always chosen or elect for what? Anytime you see the word, you come across it for what? For what? What is it? Here are some things to look at. Now we're running a little short on time we got 10 minutes. So if we could look at some of these real quick. We're almost done. John 670 is one that stumps people. I was talking with a Calvinist in a bookstore, and they were telling me about the election of God unto salvation. And I said, what do you do with John 670? And they opened up their Bible, and they read it, and they just looked at me and couldn't say a word. Okay? So it's a really good thing to think about and how the word is used. Look at verse 68. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Man, that's good stuff. Look at verse 70. Jesus answered them, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. Is this a choosing, an election to salvation? Well, they would, uh, they would say that they chose or God chose one to be, because he needed the one to be the devil. So yeah. they, they chose. So they, God, they were all chosen, but 11 were chosen for good, one was chosen yeah. for bad. God chose Judas to go to hell when he dies. Yeah. That's what, that would be their argument. That's your double predestination. We okay with that? No. Would we say that maybe Judas was chosen for a task to fulfill? If you compare this with Matthew 10, it's very startling. It could possibly be that Judas at one time actually had the power to raise the dead. I can't make sense of that. It's something in Scripture that boggles my mind. But he went out with all the rest of the apostles to the sheep of Israel. And God gave them power over demons, to raise the dead, to heal the sick, to cast out disease, all kinds of things. And Judas was part of that group. He's grouped right in with them like nothing's different. It's very strange. So I can make sense of that if I understand the elections to a task or something that needs to be fulfilled, an office to hold. I get that. But if we talk about salvation, man, that's a whole other barrel of monkeys I don't even understand. How about John chapter 15, verse 16? Same book. Dealing with the chapter that talks about the vine and branches abiding and how important that is. Similar words here. Chapter 15, verse 16. Jesus says, You did not choose me, but I chose you. And appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. Notice it's not a chosen to salvation. They've been chosen to bear fruit. That's what they've been chosen to. Chosen to what? To bear fruit. Romans 8, verse 33. Romans eight thirty three. Wonderful, wonderful chapter. Who will bring a charge against God's elect, against God's chosen ones? 
God is the one who justifies. Now, knowing the context here and that he speaks about Israel in the next chapter, who does he mean by the elect or those who are his chosen at this time? Obviously, it's talking about redeemed people. It's talking about believers. That's where it falls in this. Now, does that mean they were chosen to go to heaven when they die? That's not what this says. Remember, the word elect or chosen could also mean the word choice. My choice ones, my special ones, could be the idea. The idea of them having value for a reason. Or the, considering the fact that they are considered the better of the situation. Why would Christians be considered the better? Because they're redeemed. That would be the reason why. That could be debatable, but I believe it's consistent. Romans chapter 16, verse 13. I like this guy, Rufus. Romans 16, 13. Greet Rufus, a choice man in the Lord, also his mother and mine. I don't know what that might necessarily mean, but I, I, would want, I want to hang out with Rufus now that I know that he's a choice man. Okay? It's a good thing. Notice it's not that he was chosen to go to heaven when he dies. Colossians 3.12. This one messes people up. Colossians 3.12. I think I anticipated we were going to have more time than what I put together here. 3.12. Let's start in verse 9. Colossians 3, 9. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who has created him. Are they saved or unsaved? Saved, saved people. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, scathian, slave, or free man, but Christ is all and in all. Verse 12. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, Put on the heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Notice, what does it mean to be the chosen of God in this situation? Notice that he's calling them to a holy life. Why? Because he tells them in verse 10, you've put on the new self that's being renewed in the true knowledge. They've obviously been chosen to sanctification. Notice it doesn't say they've been chosen to justification or go to heaven when they die. And the last one that everybody likes, 2 Peter 1.10. 2 Peter 1.10. Verse 11. And this is the same vein. We don't have time to get in the, in the context, but read, it, read the context for yourself. You'll see. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you or election of you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Now, real quick, just in the verse, notice what it's talking about. Number one, he calls them brethren. They're already saved. Number two, it starts with therefore, meaning there's a whole lot of things leading up to this conclusive point that he's trying to make. Number three, he's calling them to diligence, not to believe. You're saved by faith alone. Diligence is something different in this. Notice after that, uh, you deal with the idea of if you practice these things. Well, salvation is not gained off of practicing. That's not what it's talking about. And these things you will never stumble. Why would you be worried about a lost person stumbling? It's not part of it. So notice just from the context of that one verse, we know that what he's talking here about his calling and election or choosing of you, what in the world is he talking about? I believe he's talking about choosing them, electing them, uh, uh, setting them aside for a holy life. I think that's what it deals with. And everything in the context before that from verse 3 on after the greeting deals with that. Here's always a fun one. Luke chapter 9 verse 35. This is a really great one. Luke chapter 9 verse 35. This is the last scripture that we'll deal with. Thank you guys for being patient. <clears throat> this is dealing with the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, John, and James are up there. Some miraculous stuff is going on. And then all of a sudden, a voice comes out of nowhere. Chapter 9, verse 35. Then a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Jesus Christ is a chosen one. How? Was Jesus chosen to go to heaven when he dies? <laughs> well, grief. I hope that's not the case because there's something to, to fringe upon his deity. Dr. Anthony Badger. This guy actually went to school with Pastor Steve at Dallas. He writes, Christ cannot be understood to be a person chosen from among many of similar qualities, either for eternal salvation or 
for performance of the Messiah's duty as Redeemer. He is the only one so qualified. The idea of choice one, select one, or special one easily comes through. He is the choice one in a qualitative sense, the name above all names. Excuse me, if you will. So, unconditional election and sovereignty of God. What do we learn? Number one, unconditional election. Calvinistic election comes from church history, not the Bible. It comes from Augustine and Calvin, and it was perpetuated that way. It doesn't come from the scriptures. The second one, election is under service, a task, a calling, a responsibility, etc. And also, election can be understood as something excellent or the best of its kind. It can also be understood that way, depending on the context. The sovereignty of God, well, sovereignty entails the right to rule, not meticulous control. That God and his plan is not threatened by our free choices. And God is not the author of sin. He does not cause sin. He does not need sin. He is powerful in working his good purposes out of it when sin occurs. He can do it. Sin does not threaten him. Any questions? Wow, this was just all super crystal clear and we're all... We're all in complete agreement. That's amazing. I get the right answers. The Calvinists. <laughs> I, I tell you what, this, the Calvinist view, the Reformed view, is the dominant view in the church today. I had a professor at Christian College come into a class and say that God, God determined that Adam and Eve had to sin the moment He decided to create a finite universe because He needed death. So that there would be room for everybody. Yes. Or, or he needed death in order to glorify his son in some way. There's a problem with that, though. In John 17, when Jesus is praying, he says, Glorify me with the glory that you had with me before the world began. Jesus was not in need of more glory. The Trinity already exercises perfect love and glory without needing any of that other stuff. So that's the one big thing we miss is that God doesn't need us. He doesn't. It's not like he's 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 um, less God without us. It's not what it is. But he wants us. He wants to be with us. He doesn't want to do without us. He wants us. Uh, and the problem that we find with society is, is God doesn't, or sorry, people don't want God. They need him though. He's the, he's the only thing that they need. So. Okay. Wow. I, I do, I, I do, but it's it's going back over the tenets of free grace theology and where a system's found to be inconsistent with the scriptures, it should be readily abandoned in favor of where the text leads. Because I'm proving, I'm trying to disprove all these points by the scriptures. It's pretty much my mantra through the whole the whole thing. So, yeah, it is heavy stuff. But hopefully, with the slides, you can look into it again. If you want more on the sovereignty of God problem that I see today, it's in this paper up here. You're more welcome to take it or. Uh, if you want kind of a shotgun deal here, Charlie Bing has written a really great little booklet, Are You a Calvinist? Uh, he's done a real good job on it, so he was very kind to leave it with us. And uh, kind of lined some of those things out. The ethno students ate that up when they visited our church a while back. They just took tons of copies of them because they have this problem on their campus. You've got guys who come in who've grown up in a Reformed church, have been taught this all their lives. They recognize that ethnos doesn't teach that, and then all of a sudden they want to argue. And so, which is fine. I think we should have argument. I think we should be able to do it civilly, and I think we should be able to sit and listen to one another. Uh, but ultimately, the Bible is what rules. You know, only the scriptures are in there, and not me, and not John Calvin or anybody. So uh, I'm going to get it wrong somewhere. So, but we got to come back to this. What's good to know is that most of those Calvinist churches or um, schools, whatever, are the ones that are failing really bad. Are they? Southern Baptists and all that. Well. Yeah. That, that's been, that's more from a result of their ties with evangelicalism than it is Calvinism. Buying into the whole mega church system and, and celebrity pastor idea and, 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 and abandoning the inerrancy of scripture is really what it boils down to. Um, so yeah, there's a lot that transpired with all that mess. It's really sad. It really is. Yes, sir. Tom. 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 I haven't really studied that much for that. Um, he wasn't as Lutheran as Lutherans are. Um, I'll tell you what, the interesting thing about Martin Luther, he's often credited in the Reformation as recovering the doctrine 
uh, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. But if you read about what he actually believed, he still held to infant baptism. He still held to the Eucharist. And he said, without those things, you can't be saved. And he actually broke fellowship with another Reformation pioneer named Zwingli. He actually broke fellowship with him over the issue of infant baptism in the Eucharist. So he's often credited with that. And I think it's ultimately because that's what God wanted to reveal out of that to get people back on track. But ultimately, he didn't believe it. Uh, he, was, he, was, he was used mightily by God. Let's not, ever, let's not ever downplay that whatsoever. My main concern with the Reformation is that's what it was. It was people trying to reform the Catholic Church that had already been corrupt for 1,200 years at that point. It was already a massive problem that was going on with indulgences and penance and all this other mess that happens in that. And so they were, they were trying to reform that instead of separating from that, becoming a separatist movement and asking the question, we just want to be concerned with what the Bible has to say about that. Uh, and, and I, and, you know, that's why, that's why you look back on church history and you're like, good grief, the only thing I can really see here is where they went wrong. And maybe I'm just pessimistic like that, and I hate that. Um, you know, another bad thing about Luther is that in his latter life, he was writing tracts against the Jewish people and was blaming them for the crucifixion of Christ and how much he hated them. And I sometimes wonder if his anti-Semitism, since he was located in Germany, how much of that laid the seedbed for Adolf Hitler years later. So I don't know if anybody's ever done a study on that, but I think it would be an interesting one if they could trace, you know, that 400 year span to see when, or 300 year span when that happened. So, what yeah. prompted that question was we had some friends who uh, were in a church that the pastor, when he came, started talking a lot about Martin Luther and, mm -hmm. and stuff. And then later on, surprise, he was a Calvinist. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so was Luther. You know, Luther wrote his entire book, Bondage of the Will, about pretty much how you, you, you can't do anything. You know, it's, it's, it's all God doing it through you. you not, even the ability to respond, any notion of free will is just unacceptable and that kind of thing. So, you yeah. know, there's a lot of what's creeping out. But also, uh, we have to remember that before Luther, Luther had his doctorate when he became a Christian. And he became a Christian by reading Romans chapter 3, verse 24 while he was teaching other monks in doctoral studies in a Catholic monastery. What's interesting is, is he was an Augustinian monk. So a lot of what he pulled into Romans when he was reading it about the Calvinism and predestination and all that stuff was because it stemmed from Augustine's influence, because Augustine is the father of Catholic theology. And that's where Calvin got his stuff as well. So that's what I'm saying. All of that permeated and they were trying to reform but good grief, I wish they would have just separated. You know, I don't know that anybody thought to do that because you're in this dominant hierarchy yeah, church and state system. Hi, buddy. I love you. It's okay, Michaela. <laughs> Had to get a babysitter for me. So, all right, let's pray. And Jesus, I'm so thankful for uh, just everybody being here, being attentive, being interested, uh, having questions. And hopefully we can see that the scriptures are painting uh, such an incredible and beautiful picture of you, but also emphasizing the responsibility that we have to, to be bearers of the gospel and sharers of the gospel and to also be responders to the gospel. Uh, just how important that is, Lord. And that doesn't infringe upon your will. It's, you're not threatened by any of those things, God. You're so much bigger than all of that. And so thank you, God, for being awesome and worthy of praise. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Thank you, everybody. And again, we're not meeting next week. We don't have any class next week. I'll be out of town. We will pick up with limited atonement. And we'll talk about predestination in two weeks too. If you want the sovereignty of God paper, it's up front. Uh, Mitch has them. I, we were kind of wrestling back and forth with how we handle PDFing the PowerPoint slides. Uh, and so we, we've, we've messed with some of that. So yeah.